Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Heavenly Father, I ask that you will bless us as we dive into this uh, difficult topic. I ask that you will help us to understand, have clear minds, and to cling to that which is revealed unto us, and to claim it for ourselves and for our children. We ask for your divine presence and wisdom, and that you may communicate not only what I say, but the very, and give the very impression into the mind that is needed for each individual listening. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that O C and the SDA Trinity, and that's the topic here. And we're going to look at three questions we're going to cover. Can God the Holy Spirit lead you to place your trust in nature? Can God the Holy Spirit lead you to place your trust in unrepentant sinners? And how has the belief in God the Holy Spirit affected some of the Adventists? And that's pertinent to us because that's all, all of us, that's our history, that's our background. Um, let's look at Scripture first. And that's the most important thing we look at here, is what the Scripture is telling us. We'll look at Deuteronomy 4, verse 15. And it says, Take therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb out of the midst of of the fire. And so what God is saying here is that take heed unto yourselves because you didn't see the form of God. You didn't see his, for, his similitude when he spoke to you on Mount Horeb. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them. And verse 19 says, part, second part says, And serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So what the Lord is saying here is that these things that are in nature, these things that are there, there are for everyone. They're not distinctly set aside for spiritual purposes. Neither the sun, nor the moon, nor the animals, nor anything that's found in nature. And I think most of us are familiar with that, this idea, especially if we've read the Ten Commandments. We know that we are forbidden from any type of idolatry. We should be familiar with this. But, can an understanding of the Holy Spirit, can it lead us to think that there is something spiritual that God gives us in the objects, or the animals, or the life in nature? That is certainly uh, there. And I'm going to dive into Laudato Si for a few moments here. And Laudato Si is the encyclical that was released in 2015 by Pope Francis. And um, this is something I read a while ago, and I just wanted to share some thoughts there that um, should be a caution to us. There is a strange spirituality in that encyclical, and it can be best compared to animism and pan panentheism. Uh, what is animism? Let's look at that first. The attribution of a soul to plants, inanimate objects, and natural phenomena. That's one definition. The second is the belief in a supernatural power that organizes and animates the material universe. And so you look at your dog, or you look at a cat or a horse or whatever animal you look at, and you attribute that it has a soul, that it has a soul in that animal, that it has some, something spiritual in it. And so I want to look read us something out of Laudato Si regarding this. So this is Pope Francis. And before I read, I just want to explain that he's heavily uh, relying on Saint Francis from the 13th century, who was a friar in the 13th century. And so he 
actually has taken on the, the name, the patron of this patron saint, has made it his own patron saint, Saint Francis. And so Pope Francis, here talking about Saint Francis, says that he communed with all creation, even preaching to the flowers and inviting them to praise the Lord just as if they were endowed with reason. And so he then goes on to give different poems and things that are written by uh, Saint Francis. And of course, there's some here. Praise be to you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun. Then he says the same thing regard, regarding through uh, Sister Moon and the stars, and then through Brother Wind and through Sister Water. These are animistic type ideas. And uh, you have to remember that Saint Francis is the patron saint, not only of Italy, but he was the patron saint of ecology. He was the patron saint of the animal world uh, for Catholics. And so that's, he, he was uh, actually two years after he died, he was canonized as a saint, uh, for, with, even with these strange, strange ideas that are so foreign to scripture. And so this has worked well for Catholics in terms of being able to connect with certain pagan systems of belief. It has worked well for them in that regard. But in the book, Judaism and the Environment, this, uh, this a Jewish man, Jeremy Cohen, recognizes the teachings of St. Francis as animistic, as being having animistic ideas. The Christian historian, Lynn White, in an article in 1969, uh, writing about climate change, he says that we need to change our attitude towards nature and become like St. Francis. He says, Francis tried to depose man from the monarchy over creation and set up a democracy of all God's creatures. So, can a belief of like this lead you to reverence nature? Can it? In September 2015, uh, there was a memorial service for 9-11, which was led by Pope Francis. And there, he actually affiliated in the this, in this service, connecting with the Hindus and with, and with Buddhists and with other world religions. Uh, Hindus have animistic roots. They have animistic belief system. And so do certain groups within Buddhism they have certain animistic beliefs. This interfaith exchange is consistent with the teachings of Francis of Assisi from the 13th century. Clearly, the scripture does not support such ideas and such beliefs. Can God, the Holy Spirit, lead you to place your trust in nature? In the last portion of Laudato Si, um, the spirituality described by Pope Francis is very familiar to us. It's called ecumenicism. We're all familiar with that. The idea of bringing all denominations together, bringing everyone together is, is what he wants to do in one religion. But the basis in Laudato Si for this ecumenicity, for this fraternity, for this dialogue among religions is the Trinity. But Pope Francis also applies that in a kind of a pantheistic way. And you can judge for yourself as you read this if you get that sense. I'm going to read some, some things from Pope Francis. He says, St. John of the Cross taught that all the goodness present in the realities and experiences of this world, so all the things, right, in the realities and experiences of this world, is present God in, imminently and infinitely, or more properly, in each of these sublime realities. So he's saying that in everything you experience in life, there's God present in all of it. That's what he's implying. So even when you have that nasty interaction, with, you see witness a nasty interaction at the gas station or at the grocery store, God is imminently present in all these. That's kind of what that suggests to me anyway. Um, this is not because the infinite things of this world are really divine, but because the mystic experiences the intimate connection between God and all beings, and thus feels that all things are God. So the pantheistic sentiment in Laudato Si um, may lead one to
to seek these mystic and intimate experiences between God and all beings, between sinners and saints. This is the opposite of what you find in Scripture. In Scripture you find God saying, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. In Scripture you find enmity. That Scripture, by the way, I view as the reason why there's division in the world. And it's true. It's, it's for a reason, though. It's not just because God likes to see people fight. That's not the point. He just, he loved, God loves peace. But he, we, he knows that if He does not put that enmity in us, then what would result? The result would be that men and angels would unite in desperate companionship against the government of God. That would be the result. And so, what Laudato Si and, of course, the other things published from the Vatican are trying to undo what that scripture has established, what God has established in that scripture, that um, enmity. Now, in a liberal Catholic article, Richard Fire wrote that God is not just saving people, God is saving all creation, all creation. It is all real presence according to this fire. He says the full gospel takes takes you know why the full gospel, the full gospel here of course is this idea of blending uh, what you experience and what you feel in nature with uh, what you see in scripture. So that's that's what they view as the full gospel. The full gospel according to him takes away from you any power to decide and discriminate where God is and where God isn't. The old Baltimore Catechism answers the 16th question, where is God? Quite clearly, God is everywhere. But we never really believed it, according to him. And so, you see these pantheistic ideas in Laudato Si. He says, everything is interconnected, and this invites us to develop a spirituality of that global solidarity which flows from the mystery of the Trinity. A global solidarity. Are we called to a global solidarity? The issue here is that we have to recognize just like God put the sun, the moon, the stars, the animal world, everything for everyone's benefit, right? It doesn't just benefit the Christian. It doesn't just benefit the believer. It benefits everyone. And so likewise, um, there are gifts given to men have that we rely on. I go to a dentist who's not a believer, right? You may go to a physician who is not a believer. You may go to a mechanic. You may go to a computer repair person who's not a believer. Because we truly are part of a web of humanity. We are part of the web of humanity. And we do interact with believers and non-believers in temporal matters. But in spiritual matters, there is a distinction. And that distinction must be maintained very clearly and very decisively. But this seeks to undo that. They invite us to develop a spirituality of a global solidarity, which flows from the mystery of the Trinity. From the Trinity. You see that? It's a little different. It goes beyond the common things of life, beyond the, the things that you, temporal things that you have to interact with. It tries to make us spiritually dependent on the things in this world. Um, this demonstrates, though, how it opens, can open us up, open uh, people who believe in, in, in Jesus Christ, who believe in the scriptures, to ideas of animism and pantheism. And so we've seen this so far. I think we've kind of looked at this, how the, the potential is there of the question, how can this view of God the Holy Spirit, how can this view of the Trinity, and that's what the Trinity teaches, teaches about God the Holy Spirit, and uh, how can this view affect our, our relation to nature? Can it lead us to depend on nature? And we've seen that it can, as we're called to do so by Francis of Assisi. We've seen that also in uh, these other quotes that Pope uh, Francis is giving us to uh, see, seek a global solidarity uh, with things in nature. But now our last question. How has the belief in God the Holy Spirit affected Seventh-day Adventists? It has affected me, I know, and it has affected us as well, this belief. And um, it came into Adventism first, we need to go at the beginning here, 
through J Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who was the head of the medical operations for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 1890s. He would say things like, there is present in the tree a power which creates and maintains it, a tree maker in the tree, a flower maker in the flower. Um, this is not saying that the creator is the tree or the creator is the flower, but that the creator is in the tree. The creator is in the flower. And so this would be more best described as panentheism, not pantheism. That God is in nature, not that God is nature. God, the fountain of all alike, is man's life. That is, the Spirit of God is man's life. This is not true. The Spirit of God sustains life, but the Spirit of God is, is not man's life itself. That is not itself man's life. Kellogg's book received immediate uh, uh, criticism from Spirit of Prophecy and from other people in the church. He thought he could revise it. He thought he could make some changes to it, to it, yet Mrs. White saw a deeper issue. She says, I must tell you that your ideas in regard with some things have been decidedly wrong. I would that you could see your errors. The book, Living Temple, is not to be patched up, a few changes made in it, and then advertised and praised as a valuable production. And so, there are two reasons why she was so emphatic about this. Two reasons, and we'll look at them here in this uh, letter that she wrote to John Harvey Kellogg, actually, in 1903. She says, Be careful how you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. As the Lord presents matters to me, these sentiments do not bear the endorsement of God. And this is the first reason. So the first reason is why? Sentiments in this book regarding the what? The personality of God. That was her first concern. Let's be clear here. She's primarily concerned with what? Personality of who? Of God. And God the Father. Okay, let's be clear about that. And then she says, <clears throat> But since the claim has been made, that the, the things in this book can be sustained by my statements from my writings, I am compelled to speak in denial of this claim. And that's kind of interesting to me, because there were other people who were expressing similar sentiments at that time. But Kellogg was harvesting material from her writings to support his view. And that's when she decided to speak up. <laughs> she kind of got involved. Nope, you can't use my writings to teach this error. And so that's why she, she didn't try to, you know, delve into everything. Often the ministers were wise enough to things and they would deal with them. And that's, actually that was already happening with many ministers. They were noticing problems. But she spoke up when her writings were being used and misused. So, so the first concern is the personality of God and the second is that her writings were misused. What about the personality of God makes this issue so per problematic? What about this makes it so problematic? She says in this uh, quote, God saw that a clearer revelation than nature was needed to portray both his personality and his character. So what did God see? God saw that a clearer revelation than nature was needed. He sent his son into the world to reveal, so far as could be endured by human sight, the nature and attributes of the invisible God. You want to know what God is like? Study the life of Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Don't look at the things in nature. Don't look at your, a spiritual person around you. Look at the life of Jesus. Study Jesus. The scriptures clearly indicate the relationship between God and Christ, and they bring to view as clearly the personality and individuality of each. And so they each have a personality and individuality. Now this is, um, this is about uh, the individuality of the Father and the Son, 
This is no mention here about the personality of the Holy Spirit. James White wrote this about personality. Man was made in the image of God. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Those who deny the personality of God say that image here does not mean physical form, but moral image. And so James White is saying that those who deny the personality of God um, are, saying, are denying that God has a physical form. And they say that Genesis is actually speaking about moral image, not physical form. That's what he was saying. What about Mrs. White? Did she concur with her husband on this? He says in early writings where she was shown, I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself, he said he had, but I could not behold it, for he said, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. And so, when she's referring to personality, it's quite clear she's talking about the form, the form of the Father and of the Son, this is what she equates. And this is the opposite of what Kellogg was doing. In fact, in 1904, John Harvey Kellogg, the medical director at the Battlecrook Sanitarium, is writing, writes to George I. Butler in 1904, February. He says, I believe the Spirit of God to be a personality. You don't. Okay. We'll look at what, how he uses the word personality, but I want you to pay attention to something. He's not referring primarily here to um, God the Father. He's here discussing what? The Spirit of God. So that, that's, his, that's his thing he's emphasizing. Um, Ella White and James White, when they talked about personality, they referred to the Father and the Son. This is talking about the Spirit of God. So we're talking about a different, a different subject. But this is purely a question of definition. I believe the Spirit of God is a personality. You say no, it is not a personality. Now, the, the only reason why we differ is because we differ in our ideas as to what a personality is. Your idea of personality is perhaps that of a semblance of a, to a person or a human being. This is not the scientific conception of personality, and that is not the sense in which I use the word. The scientific test for personality is this exercise of will, volition, purpose, without any reference to form or material being. And so, he used the word personality uh, to describe the spirit without, you know, but without form or material being. And so he insists that he believes um, that the spirit has um, a form without form or material being. And so that was in February. In April, um, George uh, Butler responds. It says, God dwells in us by his spirit as a comforter as a reprover, especially the firm former. So, I want to pause for a second, and I want you to grasp what is Butler saying to Kellogg? He's saying that who dwells in us? God. In what way does God dwell in us? By the Spirit. God dwells in us by the Spirit, according to what, what Butler believes it is. We'll look at this later. And he said, goes on. When we come to him, we partake of him in that sense, because the Spirit comes from him. It comes forth from the Father and the Son. It is not a person walking around on foot or flying as a literal being in any such sense as Christ and the Father are. At least, if it is, it is utterly beyond my comprehension of the meaning of language or words. So G.I. Butler insists that the Spirit comes from the Father, not a person walking around and, or flying around as a little being. Is this biblical? We'll look at that a little bit. But you can see that, um, that the way that Kellogg and 
the way that Butler are looking at, at the idea of personality is different. They define the words differently, the idea of personality. And so that Kellogg views it as a non-material, non-physical being. When Butler describes it, he views, defines personality as having material, and he says that the spirit is not that. So the question is, how did Kellogg arrive at this idea? And this is disclosed actually a year earlier, 1903, how Kellogg came to this conclusion. It was actually, uh, came from what was said to A.G. Daniels in 1903. So A.G. Daniels says, and the, he, Kellogg, then stated that his former views regarding the Trinity had stood in his way, making a clear and absolutely correct statement. So he's telling Willie White here, said that his views about the Trinity has inter had interfered with him understanding certain things. But, that within a short time, he had come to believe in the Trinity and could now see pretty clearly where all the difficulty was and believe that he could clear up the matter satisfactorily. He told me that he now believed in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And his view was that it was God the Holy Ghost, not God the Father, that filled all space and every living thing. So the Trinity helped Kellogg equalize the spirit so that he could teach that divinity fills all nature. Even the sinner, this is error, as we discussed previously. So let's summarize how Kellogg came to this conclusion. First, by adopting the belief that God the Holy Ghost is a person, but not a person having physical form, but in a scientific idea of a person, as having volition and purpose. Second, Kellogg adopted the Trinity to equalize this spirit person with the Father and the Son. This way, he could actually see it, there was a full divinity or full or equality between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Third, he did something that most Trinitarians don't do. He taught that God the Holy Ghost fills all space. So, we've come to kind of a conundrum about the Spirit here, right? There's this a person and all these different ideas. I want to turn to the Bible and look at what the Bible tells us for a moment. In the Bible, we don't find a throne for the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit has no flesh. The spirit is compared to fire, is compared to wind. This alone should make you stop and be very careful about any concluding any ideas about the spirit. It should make you realize you're on sacred ground. Stop for a moment. In the Bible, we're told the spirit is poured out. We're told that Jesus breathed on his disciple and asked him to receive the Holy Spirit. Again, this is sacred ground, and this is I, these are ideas. These are descriptions applied to the Spirit that you never find applied to the Father and the Son. Only to the Spirit, Holy Spirit you find these applications. So this is quite important to understand the distinction here. Also, what's interesting in the Scripture is that the Spirit is referred to as He, but also as It. Romans 8.16 The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so you see that the Father and the Son are never referred to with the pronoun it never referred to with the pronoun it, but the Spirit is. Uh, another example is in Matthew 10, 28. A different kind of pronoun is used here. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father, which, not who, speaketh in you. So again, the pronoun which is used. Another is 1 Peter 1, 11. The Spirit of Christ, which, again, not who, was in them the spirit which was in them. So all this evidence tells me that the Holy Spirit, or the nature of the Holy Spirit, is a mystery. In the Acts of the Apostles, 
page 55 tells us, 52 tells us, that this is the case. That the nature of the spirit is a mystery. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, right? But the things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever. How can I, how can I take the spirit, knowing all this information, and make the spirit equal in every sense to the Father and the Son? I can't, because that's not what Scripture does. But if I do that, if I take these mysterious things about the Spirit, and then I apply them to the Father and the Son, what do I do? I obscure, I obscure the things that have been revealed in Scripture. I make them hard to be seen and understood. Now, how did Kellogg's Trinitarian view enter the Seventh-day Adventist Church? In 1966, November 1966, Leroy Froome writes a letter to six different men, to Royal Anderson, Schuller, Reebok, Peterson, Turner, Weaver, and all these different men. He says, I'm writing to you as a group because you are the only living members of the original committee of 13 appointed in 1941 to frame a uniform baptismal cov covenant. And so at that time, he says, Elder Branson was the chairman and I was the secretary. Right? And everyone else, the other men are all deceased. So he's writing to the ones that are still alive in 1966. And he says, The task of this committee was to form a baptismal covenant and vow based on the 1931 fundamental belief statement in the yearbook and manual. So what was their task? It was to form a baptismal covenant and vow based on the 31 belief statement. And that was the first time, in 1931, was the first time that the word Trinity was used in the yearbook to describe fundamental beliefs. And he says, it was also to point up a bit more sharply the first, second, and third persons of the Godhead. So what has he done? He's numbered them, each uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And Godhead now, he treats as a committee. Biblically, Godhead is not a committee. Godhead is the Father. The Father is the Godhead. Did he succeed? Yes, he did. In the SDA Trinity, we read, there is uh, one God, the Father and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. <coughs> he succeeded. A unity of three co-eternal persons. Notice how the Trinity treats them as equal. And then it goes on in the fundamental beliefs. The qualities and powers exhibited in the Son and the Holy Spirit are also those of the Father. The qualities and powers exhibited in the Son and the Holy Spirit are also those of the Father. So they're all equal. In other words, the head of Christ is no longer God. Christ has no head. That's contrary to Scripture. The Scripture tells us the head of Christ is God. The Holy Spirit, we're told, is fully God, more than an influence or a force. He has the personhood and mind of God and performs a special duty to help us connect with the Father and the Son. Again, I don't want to deny what the Holy Spirit performs, what the Holy Spirit does, but this, this description of the Spirit is not consistent with Scripture. So the Trinity is here to stay. What about panentheism? Um, it, it's there looking around, you know, since the 50s at least, uh, through various aspects of our, the institutions in the, church, the Adventist Church, there's been mysticism being practiced in various different uh, sections, C contemplative prayer. Uh, there is an article in Spectrum called Pantheism, not a four-letter word. And the author says, God chooses not only to be, but to be with others. In other words, God has never been home alone and never will be. This would be at odds with whom God most basically chooses to be. And so this, again, introduces a pantheistic sentiment that's there. Uh, with not the official church, but with some within the church. We are not immune from this 
in the one true God movement. Just because we don't believe in God, the Holy Spirit, we're not immune from it. I want to read this little quote here. The foundation, according to the speaker, the most important thing, what the gospel and righteousness and faith is about, is on the fact, the truth, the reality, that we have a person dwelling within us. Now I want to qualify why he said that. He didn't say that because he believed in the Trinity. He didn't say that because he believes that um, you know, the, the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son are all equal. He didn't say that for that reason. He said that because he believes in original sin. And so because he believes in original sin, he now needs a person to dwell within him, to sanctify him. So his view of sanctification is what drove this person to this conclusion. He says, the gospel is nothing without that understanding that Christ himself is in you. And so again, it's his view of sanctification that led him in this path. So this, these ideas um, can come in through different avenues. We don't believe these things, or we shouldn't, because for us there is one God, of whom are all things, and one Lord, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Right? 1 Corinthians 8, 6. The Scripture says that He would grant you, He is the Father, that the Father would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. How does Christ dwell in your hearts? By faith. Spirit Prophecy says, Jesus Christ is everything to us, the first, the last, the best, and everything. Jesus Christ, His Spirit, His character, colors everything. It is the warp and the woof and the very texture of our entire being. The words of Christ are spirit and life. The words of Christ are spirit and life. We cannot stop to consider our disappointments or even talk of them. Now, this is important on a practical level. You know, she says we shouldn't stop to consider our disappointments or even talk about them. So practically, we, should be, we shouldn't be doing this. If we have a living Savior, we shouldn't be going around moaning about our problems, huh? For a far more pleasant picture attracts our sight, the precious love of Jesus. He dwells in us by the word of truth. How does Jesus dwell in us? by the word of truth. And I conclude with this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions.